Stanford University. So we're really lucky today in that so far for the class we've explored venture capital and kind of understood like term sheets and heard from a couple of VCs. Um, today's the first day in which we actually have someone who's been both on the VC side but also on the executive side and the startup side, um, Tom Kalinske here. So just a quick background on Tom. Um, he's a very well-renowned and well-recognized <laughs> leader in the gaming industry and the entertainment industry. So he's been formerly CEO of Mattel. How many of you guys played with Barbie dolls or Hot Wheels growing up? So we all have Tom to thank for that. <laughs> um, he's also formerly CEO of Sega of America, which is Sonic the Hedgehog, is one of their key IP characters. And he raised the value of the company from $72 million to more than $1.5 billion. He's also formerly CEO of LeapFrog, which he grew into the world's largest educational toy company. Um, has had a number of other successful roles, which I won't mention all of them. And he's also been a partner at Alsopoli Partners as an investor. Um, some of the awards that he's received include, in 1997, he was inducted into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame, which is a big deal. Um, he was also um, Starlight Foundation Man of the Year Award. Um, he's also, in general, just a number of awards around video, entertainment, gaming, and um, on the Toy Industry Hall of Fame, he's actually only one of 15 living Americans to receive this prestigious award. So, I have a couple questions um, for Tom um, that I'll kick off with, and then feel free to interrupt any time with additional questions. Um, so going to be focusing a little bit about his background and experiences um, as an executive in the toy and game industry, um, entertainment industry, and also um, have a couple of questions on the current state of uh, the gaming industry and um, some questions on investing. So um, interrupt any time and um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Sure. So, um, so in terms of um, background, maybe we can start a little, about, a little bit in terms of your experiences at Mattel. Um, you joined in 1972 when you were um, CEO um, starting in 1985. And um, specifically, you joined after um, you started, uh, after you completed your MBA. And how did you decide to end up in the toy industry in the first place, and Mattel specifically? And um, I know we have a few MBA students yeah. in the it, room as well. Yeah, it was actually quite accidental. I was working in New York City uh, in a unit that, for J. Walter Thompson, in a unit that developed new products for existing advertising clients. Mm -hmm. And one of the clients was Miles Laboratories, and they had a vitamin called Chalks for children, chocolate square bill. And uh, one day, Bristol Myers brought out animal, multicolored, multi-flavored vitamins, and the Chalks business literally disappeared. You've never seen anything decline as fast as it declined. And so they asked us to develop a new uh, product for them, and uh, we ended up developing Flintstones vitamins for them. Uh, I ended up moving to Elkhart, Indiana for a while to develop the plan and in six months it was the number one vitamin in the United States and it still is today. So anyway, along the way, about 1971, I had to appear before a Senate subcommittee hearing on children's advertising and of course they were crucifying the sugar and cereal guys and the candy guys and the toy guys were getting some abuse as well and so was I. And, uh, uh, apparently the Mattel people liked my testimony in front of Senator Margaret Chase Smith from Maine. You know, you're sitting down at a Formica table and they have these big mahogany desks up above you and they basically accuse you of, you know, beating your mother and things. Uh, <laughs> the question she posed to me was, so Mr. Kalinske, you like selling drugs to children? And I said, well, as you know, Senator, I'm sure you're aware that most children in this country aren't getting proper nutrition, and it isn't that their mothers don't want them to, it's just that the kids won't eat vegetables and fruit. And so they're really thankful that they have a vitamin that the kids like and will take, and that way they can be sure they're getting the right vitamins and, and minerals. And, uh, and by the way, I have a letter here. Let me read it to you from a mother. And I read her letter basically saying that. And then I pulled out a mailbag and I said, I have a few thousand other letters. Would you like me to read those to you as well? And she said, no, that'll be enough, Mr. Kalinske. And I was never asked another question, but the Mattel guys were sitting behind me and they laughed and they thought this. So afterwards, they invited me out to Hawthorne, California. And a few months after that, I was interviewing for a job and ended up as a product manager at, at, at Mattel. Mm -hmm and then became CEO. Well, it didn't happen just <laughs> like that. I, it was a long road. So I was working as a product manager on preschool toys, which was CNCs, Jack in the Boxes, Putt Putts. And one day the founder of Mattel, Ruth Handler, walked into my cubicle, which was right outside the ladies' room. So it was, I got a lot of traffic. And, uh, and she, she said, Tom, Barbie just declined in sales last year. That would have been 1972. And, my Salesforce says it's over for Barbie. The retail buyers say it's over for Barbie. The Wall Street analysts say it's over for Barbie. What do you think about that? 
And I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. And she said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the product director on Marky, uh, marketing director on Barbie. And so, and I along the way asked her, I said, so what, Ruth, what made Barbie so good? And she said, because with Barbie, a girl can be anything she wants to be. And so I used that line, almost those exact words, in packaging and advertising PR for the next 15 years and, and lived by that uh, saying, basically, on, at least on the Barbie business. Yeah. Can we dive into that a little bit more since sure. this class is focused on entrepreneurship, startups, and venture yeah. capital? And I think one of the key decisions that's probably the most challenging decision that a lot of founders have to make is reviving a product line, deciding on whether or not to continue a product. Mm -hmm. And you revived the Barbie doll line mm -hmm. as well as the Hot Wheels line. Yeah. Like, what was the thought process behind that? Well, it, it was, I, I, we had to do something different. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, I know this sounds crazy today, but the company was doing one new doll a year, one new line of fashions, one major accessory, and one low-cost accessory. And they had very little space at retail. Uh, the packages were all different colors, the uh, orange for one type of uh, product, green for another type of Barbie product, brown for another. So anyway, I, I said, well, this is nuts. Let's segment the market. And so I segmented, and I said, we're not going to do just one doll. We're going to do a lot of dolls. And I segmented the market by age, by play pattern, and by, by price, basically. So I did Barbies for, that were very simple to dress for young girls called My First Barbie. I did very low-cost Barbie called Malibu Barbie. That was $3.95 retail price. The idea being if you bought one, you'd have to buy costumes and, and accessories for that doll. And I did Occupation Barbies. I actually did President Barbie in 1976. So uh, I don't remember if it sold that well, but I, I know that Dr. Barbie sold very well and Veterinarian Barbie sold very well. Actually, the only occupation that really didn't sell was Lawyer Barbie. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and then I did deals with uh, Oscar de la Renna and Bob Mackey, the House of Chanel, and did very exquisite fashions on Barbies that we'd priced in those days for maybe $60. Today they're like $100. So I segmented the doll side of the business, did the same thing with fashions, and did the same thing with accessories. And every year I'd bring out a new house that we sold basically empty, and you then had to buy lots of furniture. To <laughs> it was the hardware software model, essentially. Uh, and so that was, it was just a different way of thinking about it, and we ended up with 48 feet uh, of pink at retail. And the Barbie business grew from, I started on it, it was $42 million. When I turned it over to a gal named Jill Barad, it was $550 million. She grew it to a billion and a half. But I always told her that my percent increases were bigger than hers. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Jill, Jill was terrific and, and, uh, and built, the, built the brand uh, dramatically. It had a few years recently where it fail, fell down. And in my opinion, the reason it fell down was they went away from, they weren't doing occupations anymore, and they walked away from, with Barbie, you can be anything you want to be. And they were using some other tagline. And I notice now they've returned to that and the sales are going back up. And I don't think that's coincidental. So in, in the, the Barbie business was just think differently about, about how we were doing the business and really segment the market well. I also was very vicious with competition. Um, uh, Topper Toys brought out, you probably don't remember this, brought out the Dawn dolls. Anybody remember the Dawn doll? And that was competitive with Barbie. So one year I did a promotion where it was basically turn in your Dawn doll and get a Barbie for one dollar. It put Dawn out of business. I'm sure that's not legal today, but it was, I think it was legal back then. You think? <laughs> um, what about Masters of the Universe? That was another brand. Yeah. Masters is one of those unusual, uh, in the toy industry anyway, products that came completely out of market research. Uh, Hasbro had G.I. Joe, Hasbro had Star Wars, Mattel had Big Jim, who was not selling and wasn't a competitor in any stretch of the imagination. So we researched every theme you could think of, whether it was a licensed theme like Marvel or DC Comics heroes or occupations like policemen and firemen or space or cowboys and Indians or this strange fantasy figure who was very muscular and had a ferocious enemy named Skeletor. And it turned out that was the winning concept. And, uh, and so uh, and f we, we decided to produce the, the He-Man, he I have the power. Anybody remember He-Man holding the sword? I have the power. So we did the, we did the uh, toy line, 
And it was very successful. We did 75 million in revenue, literally its first, its first year. He had a series of friends, Skeletor had a series of friends who were the enemies of He-Man. And they fought it out in Castle Grayskull. Um, so the chairman walked into my office. At the time, I was actually president of the toy division. And Mattel in those days was a conglomerate. We owned Ringling Brothers, Barnum & Bailey Circus. We owned Western Publishing. We owned an electric organ company. We owned a tape manufacturing company. Uh, pet supply company. Lots of things that, that didn't necessarily hang together real well. But anyway, this chairman walked in my office. He said, well, it's nice. You've got now got a mail action line of 75 million in revenue, but you'll never compete with the big companies like Star Wars or, or, or G.I. Joe because you don't have a TV show or a movie and you can't get one. And I said, you want to bet? And so I did a deal with uh, Group, Group W who own TV stations across the United States. And I, I employed Filmation Studios, and we each invested three and a half million dollars, and we developed 65 half-hour episodes of Masters of the Universe television shows where, where He-Man fought it out with Skeletor. But at the end of every 30-minute show, there was a moral message, you know, like, it's bad to steal from your neighbor, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, we gave them away, gave these shows away to the TV stations in return for three 30-second commercials, slots. And we'd either use our own, ad we couldn't advertise Masters of the Universe, but we could advertise Hot Wheels or other products on there. Or we'd sell them. And we ended up selling most of our 30 second spots, and we ended up making more than we had invested in the show, way more. We ended up making a, a huge profit off of the television show to the point where we, we developed another 65 episodes for the following, uh, the following year. So we had 130 under our belt by the time we were, we were done. And that model of taking a toy property and developing a t TV show around it, we did for Princess of Power, we did it for Popples, we did it for Rainbow Bright. Uh, Hasbro started doing it for basically everything that they have and, and, and frankly outdid Mattel because they would do movies also. They acquired the Transformer license from, from, uh, from uh, uh, a Japanese toy company and ended up producing, all, as you know, all the Transformers movies that have been really terrific. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of the, that's the He-Man yeah. story. So I guess uh, jumping forward to 1987 and um, transitioning specifically from Mattel to actually Mattel's um, competitor, Matchbox, and becoming CEO of that. Uh, Matchbox, which had, um, I guess, uh, the, it was the main competitor of Hot Wheels. Like, what exactly was that transition like? And also, yeah. like, I think if I had, um, if I was on the board of a company and my CEO just jumped to become CEO of a competitive competitive company, like, I guess, like, what was the reaction at Mattel as well? Yeah, I I interesting. Well, there were, I was actually co-CEO of Mattel, and I thought that was sort of a crazy situation to have two CEOs of a company. At the time, the company was doing about $2 billion, so I mean, from the board's point of view, that may, sort of made sense to have two CEOs, but from my point of view, it didn't make, it didn't make a lot of sense. And I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. Uh, and, and actually, Mattel had tried to buy Matchbox. Matchbox was in receivership in the UK and had failed. And a friend of mine who was a manufacturer for Mattel, a guy named David Ye, who ran something called Universal Manufacturing, he was a vendor for Mattel. He made a lot of our products and he knew die casting very well. Uh, we decided to get together and we made an offer and we bought Matchbox out of receivership in the UK. And the, the, the reason we were able to do that was we agreed to keep a factory open in the UK and nobody else would agree to do that. Everybody else said, you can't make things in the UK anymore, you gotta move them all to, to China or, or the Far East. So we, uh, we had to reorganize the company and to answer your question, yeah, some of the Mattel people were, were, were upset uh, as, and as it turned out, a guy who had been a VP at Mattel was then running Matchbox and doing a very poor job of it, and I had to fire him. So that was also kind of weird, you know, to an old friend that I had to go in and fire because he was doing a bad job. So it wasn't, that wasn't too much fun. Um, but anyway, we, David and I toured around Europe. Most of the business was in Europe. We toured around Europe, each office, and we reorganized every office. It was difficult to do in those days because of European laws. Uh, but we managed it. Uh, we managed to return the company to profitability. We did move most of the manufacturing to, to China. Uh, we kept one plant open in Enfield uh, outside of London where they make the rifles. And uh, 
And uh, it, was a, it was a really hard period of time for me because I was traveling 200 days a year. And I ended up uh, uh, suggesting to David that we sell it. And we ended up selling it to Tyco. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, Tyco got bought by Mattel. So it all went full circle. And M Matchbox is now a Mattel brand. Yeah. Got it. So um, you've had a lot of experiences. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next company you're a CEO of, Sega of America, Sonic yes. the Hedgehog. And um, I think probably this is interesting because you transitioned from the toy industry into the video gaming industry. Like, were those two industries pretty connected at the time that it was an easy transition? Yeah. Or? They were. And I didn't mention that at Mattel, uh, a group that I actually uh, worked for me started the, uh, uh, the handheld game business at Mattel. You may remember uh, the racing game and, uh, and a tank fighting game and a few other things. And then we also started in television there. And the board at the time thought that the video game business was going to be so big it should be its own separate company. So they spun in television out and moved it down the street from where the toy company was and formed a separate company. So I knew a little bit about video games, but I knew about the technology at that time, which was basically two-bit games. I mean, they were very, very small and uh, no, nothing like what came later. So when I went to, uh, to Sega, I, uh, Sega actually had asked me to distribute their products when I was CEO of Matchbox, because we had such a good distribution network and such good retail relationships. But I did, it, that was their 8-bit system, and I didn't think that was good enough, and so I, I didn't do it. And the, the chairman of, of Sega basically uh, tracked me down after I had sold Matchbox. Uh, I was on vacation in Hawaii. And he, he basically asked me to come back to Japan and look at what 16-bit technology was and what a color handheld uh, mobile unit would look like, which became Game Gear. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with 16-bit technology because for me, it was so different from what I had experienced previously uh, uh, at Intellivision. And, uh, and I decided to, to take on that, that, that role and to try to, the company was only doing like 50 million or something in the United States Yeah, that actually time. is um, my next question, which is um, Sega of America. We're all trying to create billion dollar companies, yeah. unicorns here. And yeah. just to throw out some numbers, like you grew the company from 72 million to more than one and a half billion. Mm -hmm. And then the market value of Sega as a whole grew from less than two billion to more than five billion. And like kind of, any general tips on how you well, kind of did that? And there, yeah. I know there's also an entire book on um, the console wars in which you're featured heavily yeah. in, and a movie that's coming out that we'll all watch. Yes, so. everybody <laughs> should buy Console Wars, the yeah. book, or you can listen to it auditorially. Yeah. It's actually used in some business schools, by the mm -hmm. way. As a, anyway. Part of the required reading, actually, for mm -hmm. today. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes, I, I looked at the business, and again, I could see that Nintendo had 95, at least 95% of the market back in 1990. And uh, it would have been foolish just to try to do what Nintendo was doing. So my strategy was we're, we're going to not do what Nintendo was doing. We're going to leave them the kids' business. We're going to go after teenagers and college age and young adults. And we're going to do sports games, a lot more sports games than they had very few. And, uh, and we're going to do strategy games. We're going to do role-playing games. And we're going to do more American licenses. And, and by the way, we have to have our own character to fight against Mario. And along the way, we're, we're going to lower our price of our hardware from $200 to 149 And shortly, I discovered that Sonic the Hedgehog was in development in Japan. And it clearly was the best thing that the company had going for it. And I said, we're going to put that title in with the hardware that'll force the purchase of hardware because Sonic isn't going to be available on a Nintendo system. Well, the board of directors of Sega thought I was crazy. They thought it was nuts to take on Nintendo. I, ma I made fun of Nintendo in advertising, uh, positioned them as the little kid system, positioned them as, as, as not a grown-up uh, adult type of system. And, uh, and you know, probably all remember Welcome to the Next Level and the Sega scream, which we ended each commercial <laughs> with. Uh, and the board thought I was crazy. They didn't want to do any of it. But the, the CEO said, hey, I, I promised you could make the decisions for the Western world, so go ahead and do these things. And we quickly became, uh, we grew very rapidly, and we, we passed them in, in, uh, in share of market by 1993. We were larger than, than Nintendo. And of course, we had our color Game Gear unit, which we competed against the black and white uh, Game Boy handheld. Uh, and that was fun. 
Uh, and for a while, we passed them in share of market as well on the mobile side. Mm -hmm. And then you took the approach of licensing more sports and TV IP yes, to engage yes. kind of an older audience. Like, yes. how did you develop that strategy specifically? Yes. Well, it was obvious to me we couldn't. It, we just couldn't do the young stuff that Nintendo was doing and expect to to win that battle. We had to go after older <laughs> older age properties and American licenses. And of course, I did Joe Montana football, and 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 EA did Madden football, and Joe Montana actually outsold Madden for the first few years. And, uh, and we did NBA basketball and MLB baseball and FIFA soccer for, for Europe and uh, uh, all of those, those kinds of products. Uh, but uh, can I tell one Walmart story? Yep. So, so believe it or not, Nintendo was so powerful in those days. First of all, third party publishers were afraid to publish on Sega because they were afraid they'd get, they'd get punished by Nintendo. Nintendo wouldn't give them the, the units that they, Nintendo manufactured all of the, the ROM cartridges for all their third party publishers, so they tightly controlled the market. They were afraid they wouldn't get what they needed. Retailers similarly were afraid if they carried Sega, Nintendo wouldn't ship them the NES hardware that they wanted or the software that they wanted. So even Walmart, now this, you can't, I was very close with the Walmart senior management. Sam Walton and I used to fly around the United States looking at retail stores and going through them together. So I knew everybody in, in Wal, uh, Walmart and they wouldn't carry Sega, so it really hurt my feelings. And there was down the street on Highway 41, there is a shopping mall, uh, a strip mall, and there was an empty store, so I rented it, and I put a huge Sega billboard up, come play Sega for free, and I put uh, 50 big screen TVs, as big as you could get in those days, and Sega Genesis hooked up to that, come play Sega for free. I had lines of teenagers out the door. I bought every billboard in and out of Bentonville, Arkansas, where Walmart is headquartered, and I bought all the radio time I could and the TV time I could, and I bought the seat cushions at the football stadium, Art University of Arkansas, down, down the road, so when they held up the seat cushions to make different statements. You know, you'd see Sega when they turned them all over. And I would call the head of uh, the vice president in charge of the video game area and I'd say, Rick, this week we outsold Nintendo by 20% at Target and 30% at Toys R Us. And uh, pretty soon he called me back and he said, okay, my management will kill me if I don't start carrying Sega products, we give up, and he gave me four feet, and from then on, uh, we, we outsold Nintendo and Walmart as well. My point is that, you know, when you're the underdog, you've got to be really persistent, you've got to do things a little bit uh, uh, grassroots marketing, I guess, and, and differently than, than your co competition was doing. By the way, we also, on every college campus, including this one, we used to have a couple people who played Genesis games that we gave them the hardware and we gave them all the software and all they had to do was run around the campus, we hoped they ran around the campus, and talk up Sega Genesis. And I did that on almost every college campus in the United States. So lots of success. Let's talk about what you've um, called the stupidest decision in the history of business. Specifically <laughs> that um, you and Sony of America um, came to an agreement to build a single platform together and share the development costs for that, but then yeah. that deal didn't go through. What yeah. happened there? Yeah, uh, I was very close. Sony in those days did not how, know how to develop video game software. So we had this close relationship where we basically taught them at Sega because they were going to be a good third party publisher for us. And I got very close with a guy named Olaf Olafsson, brilliant guy, uh, and, his, and his boss, uh, who was the president of Sony uh, of, of America, and we decided, you know, this hardware business is, is really tough because you can't make money selling hardware. So why don't we create the next hardware system where we both jointly agree on the specs and we will produce it at Sony's factories uh, and we'll split the loss on it. And, but whoever does the best software will obviously get the revenue and the profits from that software. And, uh, and uh, so I went to, we went to Japan, where both companies are headquartered, and the president of Sony, IDA, said, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do it, because they weren't doing hardware at the time. Um, the president, my boss, the CEO of, of Sega said, nah, why would we do that? They don't know how to do video games. We shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, help them, or we don't, shouldn't share our knowledge with them. And that, to me, was absolutely idiotic, because clearly we knew how to do, we did know how to do video games better than Sony did in those days. And to have one hardware system out there that was the Sony Sega system, we would have absolutely buried Nintendo 
and Microsoft, who we knew was coming out with a, with a system. So I think it was just a very, very dumb decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so specifically with Sega, working with folks in Japan and also having offices here, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the challenges for companies working um, across borders and just having a number of offices internationally? Yeah. Um, we, in, in, mine was an unusual situation in that for quite a long while, I literally was allowed to do whatever the hell I wanted in, in the United States and Europe. But what I didn't realize was Sega in Japan was not very successful in the local market with, with uh, Genesis, or they called Mega Drive. And, uh, and every Monday, they had this meeting they called the, in the decision room, and uh, the CEO would walk in and beat up the local Japanese marketing and product development team for not being as successful as we were in the, being in the United States. Well, you can imagine over time what this does. Pretty soon those managers in, in Sega Japan grew to hate Sega of America. Uh, you know, they were constantly being compared to us and they weren't able to, to be as successful. And it was really a, a difficult situation for them. And so they started to not be as helpful as they previously had been. And when you're in a big multinational corporation, you, 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 know, you need help. You need to have the parties all working together. So that became a, 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 a sore spot for both me and, and for, for them. And I started getting ordered by uh, Nakayama, because they were influencing him too, to do things that were not correct for the United States market. Uh, I, was entered, I was ordered to introduce the Saturn system, which I didn't like to start with, uh, and, and I, tried to, I had tried to uh, uh, get it delayed. I was ordered to, to, to introduce it before I wanted to and before I had enough software done for it, and uh, that, was a, that was a really painful decision, and it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for me because I, I didn't... I knew it was going to fail, and I didn't want to be associated with it. So that was when I resigned. But working cross borders, had wor it worked for a long time until this friction occurred uh, where we were wildly successful, and they, weren't, they never got above a 12% market share in Japan. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so let's talk about the next company you were president and CEO of, um, <laughs> 1997, Knowledge Universe. Yes. Many others after that, but we'll talk about Knowledge Universe first. Yeah. And um, this company at one point was, um, to quote, the largest single private provider of early childhood education mm -hmm. services in the country with like over 40,000 employees on three continents. And once again, you helped build this company into an industry leader. Can you talk about how you did that? And yeah. Um, kind of lessons learned on that front. Yeah, it, it, the, the reason for Knowledge Universe existing was because Larry Ellison wanted to use technology to improve education, and so did Mike Milken. And it turned out I knew both of them. And so they, they, uh, they hired me as, as CEO. And I didn't mention, when I was at Sega, I, had, I really fell in love with the idea of using video game technology to improve education. And we had a product called Pico, which was the child's first computer. And it was it connected to a TV, and you put a book on top of it. But when you uh, had a stylus that you touched on the book, the picture would come alive on the television screen, and, and the, the still picture would get animated and talk to the child. And it was really cool. And, and we sold like $100 million worth of that one product. Uh, and my board at Sega said, what are you messing around with that for? If you do another Sonic title, you do $400 million in revenue, and it's easier. And they were right, you know, it's hard to do education well and to do it uh, uh, in, in a way that, that really can, can change lives. So w at Knowledge Universe, our mission was literally cradle to grave education. Um, as you mentioned, we were the largest in preschool. We ended up by, and the way that occurred was right here in, in uh, the Bay Area, I negotiated a deal to buy something called Child Discovery Centers which was a chain of about 100 preschools, so mostly around California and Oregon and a few in Arizona. And we expand, we changed the name to Knowledge Beginnings. Everything we did was sort of knowledge something usually, or we tried to anyway, uh, except in the case of LeapFrog. Uh, and we grew that around the country by building new preschool centers and we were using technology in, the, in these classrooms for young kids and we had cameras so moms at work could look at their 
their children uh, and what was going on in the classrooms. I don't think some employers appreciated that because the moms would end up watching the child in the classroom all day. But anyway, uh, we grew that very dramatically to where we were the largest child care provider in the United States. So we had something for very young kids. At the same time, we were also, largely because of Larry, very interested in IT education and training. So we started, we, we bought a small company in, in, in uh, London called uh, CRT, Computer uh, or Consulting, Recruiting, and Training. And his, their idea of that company was IT specialists, uh, we'd place them in jobs uh, for helping companies with their IT systems. And then when they finished that job, we'd train them for the next higher level of IT uh, uh, work and place them again and just keep doing that over and over again until they, they kept improving their skills and their amount of pay. We grew that to about a $750 million business in, in uh, the UK and Europe. We did the same thing with an IT training company in the United States called Productivity Point. Um, we had the largest teacher training company in the United States for teaching IT called uh, Teacher, Uni uh, Teacher Universe. Um, and uh, let's see, what else did we do? Oh, one day a guy walked in, my, a guy named Ron Packer walked into my office and he said, you know, there's a million and a half parents that are homeschooling in the United States, but it's really hard for them to figure out what's the best curriculum. Let's put the best curriculum together and, uh, and make it easier for them. And so he, I, sure, so he did that and that net company be, became known as, as uh, K-12. Uh, and it, it grew nicely. And one day he came back in my office and he said, there's this new thing hap happening in the United States called charter schools. Let's put the curriculum together for charter schools. So we did that. And, uh, and today I think uh, K-12 is a public company. It has about a billion dollar market cap. So uh, that too was a very, very successful effort. Now we had a number of things we tried that were, were not successful. We were very early on in, in trying to uh, uh, put uh, advertising in like on YouTube it wasn't a YouTube there was another thing that we had developed like YouTube and it didn't take off at the time so you know we had a number of things that didn't work but overall and I, I know you're gonna ask me about leapfrog so I'll, I won't talk about that yet so after nine years we had uh, 36 different companies about 18 of them we started ourselves about 18 of them we acquired we had revenue over two billion dollars and the equity value of those companies was estimated. Sometimes it was easy to estimate it because it was a public company. Other times you had to get a banker come in and say this is what it's worth. Uh, it was estimated at about 3.6 billion. So the $500 million investment that Larry and Mike made was a, a pretty good investment. And my only point of mentioning that is that it does show that for-profit education can be a very good business. Um, what is the success, success rate of the AC companies that you acquired? Very high. Uh, we had a very high success rate. Uh, you know, I'm one of those people where it's always hard for me to remember the failures, but I know we had some. <laughs> and I mentioned the Yaya one was a failure. Um, most, of the, most of those companies were reasonably, uh, were reasonably sick. Oh, I know one that d wasn't. We considered consulting also to be educational, so we put together a couple of consulting companies, and uh, the problem with that was when we bought the consulting companies, what are you buying? You're buying the talent that's inside the consulting company. As soon as we bought those companies, or a few months after we bought them, those consultants would leave and go somewhere else and start another company. So that one was a terrible mistake and a, and a big failure that we, that we lost money on. Oh, one other one that we lost money on. Actually, we used some Stanford professors on this one. <laughs> we had this brilliant idea that you should get your MBA online from Nobel Prize winning professors. Right? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So we had professors uh, Scholes, we had Becker from Chicago, we had uh, guys from uh, Carnegie Mellon in operations, guys Wyant's from another, Harvard. Uh, John Wyant's another Nobel Prize professor. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> we didn't have you, we should have. <laughs> but anyway, what happened was, this was about 2001, so you can imagine online wasn't exactly great in 2001. And we would film these professors, these Nobel Prize winning professors, in, you know, for their, the, try to develop the curriculum well and, and have a way of doing study groups on the side and communications and what have you. But most of the Nobel Prize winning professors 
were terrible teachers. I mean, they were brilliant guys, but they just, they just couldn't communicate in front of a camera. And, uh, and we spent $20 million filming and putting together this curriculum for an online MBA. And we got very lucky. It wasn't successful. We were able to sell all of that curriculum to uh, Thompson Education in Canada, who still uses it today, but not for an MBA. They took the finance portion and they use it in corporate training for training the finance officers in, in the corporation. They took the marketing portion and they use it for training the marketing uh, in corporation. So they use it in corporate training today. So it certainly was not successful for us, but I guess it's somewhat successful for them. But anyway, most of what we did was, was fortunately pretty successful. And a lot of that was timing too. You can imagine IT training before 2000, that was, that was a slam dunk. Other questions related to that? Chad, as an inveterate uh, kind of optimizer, research resource allocator from you know, orbital trajectories to uh, global energy and environment resources, um, I wonder how you think about with all your broad span of activities, <coughs> how to allocate, this, this may not be a question for you, but how do you allocate resources and attention across all of those different businesses? You and mean how you personally? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. just you personally, just because you have this very unique um, history, uh, yeah. starting and um, ending multiple businesses and maybe even having you know, new ones compete with old ones, yeah. so and so on. I actually asked once, the, uh, we, we did a big project for uh, General Motors of all people on the R&D labs, and I used to always ask the higher ups there, how do you decide how much money to spend on Tiger Woods ads, which was a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm versus you know, artificial intelligence design and manufacturing technology versus alternative vehicles and stuff. Yeah. It seems like your range is, good, is much broader than that. So how do you keep from getting run down by too many things going on? Or is it just you're a guy like Ernestine who finds sweet spots and just goes for that and avoids anything else that isn't super cool? Well, I, I, I guess I hope it's obvious it wasn't just me. It was a team and I have been so fortunate in my career that I had great teams at Mattel, uh, fabulous teams at Sega, and fabulous teams at, at Knowledge Universe. And so, but it was still hard for personally to allocate my time and attention. And on top of all the businesses that Mike and Larry are not the easiest guys in the world to have above you. So they required a lot of hand holding and attention as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> I knew a couple of his wives yeah. pretty well. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I would fly down to uh, L.A. basically every Monday night, and I stayed in Mike's guest house uh, when I was not traveling elsewhere. And he gets up at 4 in the morning, and he expects you to. Uh, and we would work till midnight. The guy doesn't sleep. It's unbelievable. So it was, it, it was very difficult. But, but in terms of allocating my own resources for the, with the companies, I knew what I was better at, and what I was better at was those businesses that involved uh, younger people, you know, college age and under. The businesses that, that involved uh, IT experts, I left to another guy named Steve Fink. And so the two of us basically divided the 36 companies, and I, I focused more on those that were youth-oriented, and he focused more on those that were adult or IT-oriented. Uh, but, and that was just one way, but it was hard. It was very hard. Uh, and, I, and I also, which Ernestine's going to ask me, I know, is I was also CEO of LeapFrog at the same time and was building LeapFrog from being a $3 million business to a very large business. Yeah, so I will ask you about LeapFrog. Um, so I think this is uh, the last company that you were CEO of, um, but we don't know since um, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to take on some new roles in the next few years. Um, so LeapFrog came out of Knowledge Universe, and you built it into the largest education toy company in the United States with over $600 million in revenue. Um, I guess, like, specifically, this is educational toys. Like, what was different on your strategy for that, yeah. and how exactly did you do that? Yeah, and again, everybody thought we were crazy to, to, to do it. Uh, I mean, I'm everybody. I mean, the people, toy experts thought we were nuts. Wall Street thought we were nuts. Analysts in general thought we were nuts because they said, Everybody says they want education for their kids, but they won't pay for it, you know? And, and our strategy was, and this was completely a Stanford University started company, uh, 
Dr. Robert Calfee, who was Associate Dean of the School of Graduate School of Education, literally designed the original product curriculum that we, that we had in, in, our, in our products. He was very, very important to the, to the company. And, he, and until I left as CEO, every product we made went through his eyes and his work, and he used a, a, a lot of grad students. Uh, we had free, free advice, I think, from a lot of grad students in the School of Education involving our, our, our products. But what made us different was uh, we did it correctly, I think. Uh, we had a scope and sequence for reading, uh, math, or numeracy, math, uh, social studies, from literally, what do you need to know as a two-year-old through a seven-year-old? No other company had this. And we would, we would literally teach kids how to read correctly, at least according to the Stanford School of Education correctly. And uh, we built that into every product that we, that we designed. We, we would always say, all right, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Okay, it's teaching a, a two-year-old what they need to know about beginning reading. Uh, which is, uh, starts with shapes and identifying shapes and objects and what have you. And then what do you need to know as a four-year-old, a five-year-old? And we would put that into products. Uh, and then we would make the product and the curriculum fun. So from our standpoint, it was education first and then make it fun and interesting. And I think that's what separated us from anybody else. And we also believed in technology. The founder of the company was Mike Wood, a Stanford graduate, uh, a Stanford uh, 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 MBA, and uh, and he was a brilliant guy, and very, and very focused guy. I mean, he was unbelievable. He there was nothing that he felt couldn't be done, um, and we built a team around Mike. And uh, I was above him, and he he used to yell a lot and throw things and stuff, and I had to calm him down. Uh, typical Stanford graduate, I guess. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, and we acquired a technology. The, the technology that we acquired initially on the first leap pad was a conductive ink that we put underneath the plastic uh, and a, a book-like thing that looked like a notepad. And you'd put printed books on top of it. And with the stylus, that stylus could either read word for word and, 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 and you know, auditorily uh, give you the sounds the, of, of words or animals or what have you or could read the complete story. You could touch a picture and it would come to life and, t and talk to you. Uh, in that particular technology we used in a globe where we did all the countries around the world and the, the, the music from those countries. The, we could tell you what the highest mountain in that country was, the longest river, the population, the number of cars, the number of telephones, et cetera. So stuff like that became uh, uh, very good sellers for us. Um, we ended up doing our own tablet, which was probably the downfall of, of or the decline of the company started when we started selling ta tablets because we were competing with Apple. And I had, I had left the company as CEO in 2005 and I kept saying, we've got to take all this great Stanford content and put it on iPhones, uh, iPads, Android tablets, and never quite got that, never quite got that done. But anyway, uh, we grew it to 680 million and, uh, and it declined to about 350 million last year. Anyway, it was a great experience yeah. though. So you've been CEO over half a dozen very, very mm -hmm. successful companies. Why did you decide to leave each of those companies at different points? Mm -hmm. And um, like kind of what was the big thing that attracted you to a company in the first place? Yeah, well, obviously in the case of Knowledge Universe, I really had a, a desire to use technology to improve education. Uh, in, in all aspects of education. And um, so, I, you know, I really had a strong feeling for that and I, and I loved the idea of doing it. So I felt very, very strongly about that. Uh, when, I, when I stepped down as CEO of LeapFrog, I thought I was going to retire. I mean, that was uh, 2005, it was 10 years ago. And but what happened was I had to work on dividing the assets of all 36 Knowledge Universe companies back to Mike and Larry, because they each owned most of, you know, I owned a little, but, and Steve Fink owned a little, but most of it was owned by Larry and Mike. And it took me three years to get those assets divided and, and back to, to uh, Larry and Mike. And I then went on, I thought I was going to retire, and I started going on boards. 
And that's what I'm basically doing today. I'm mostly on boards. I'm chairman of uh, Global Education Learning, and we have a business in, in China that we just sold. We built the largest online site in China that taught moms, uh, or moms would ask questions of the site on how to educate their, their children of, again, very young children, zero to seven is what we focused on. And if we didn't have content on our site that could answer the mom's question, our commitment was we would have a professor from somewhere one of the universities in China answer her question within 24 hours. So the site's called Yalan in Mandarin. That means, some of you speak Mandarin here, it means cradle. <laughs> you know the company. Uh, and we built it from a few million moms using it to uh, 20 million moms using it uh, three or more times a month. We also dealt with health and nutrition questions for moms. And I loved that business. I thought it was just a terrific, terrific business. But a private equity firm offered uh, quite a bit of money to buy it. And uh, my VC investors <laughs> said, take the money and run. So we, we sold the company. And now my partner, uh, Anthony Chang, another Stanford graduate uh, who lives in China, and I are looking for another education entity in China right now. I'm also on the board of Cambium Learning Group, which is a, a public company, NASDAQ company, ABCD. Um, specializes in curriculum for kids with learning issues, either exceptional learners or behind learners, one or the, one or the other. So not your normal curriculum. When my role there has been to help them uh, move away from just print to certainly a, com a, 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 certainly a combination of print and technology, uh, and an awful lot of it is now moved completely online. Uh, we have an entity called Learning A to Z, which is one of the fastest growing education reading companies for, for young kids again in the, in the United States. And I'm also trying to help them move into uh, to China and, uh, and other markets. I'm on the board of something called Adjunct Professor Link, which is uh, as not Stanford, but community colleges and state universities, 70% of their courses are taught by adjuncts. And uh, I guess you're an adjunct in a way. No. no, but anyway, you're not. <laughs> the, the, sometimes the adjuncts were really good and sometimes not so much. And so what this professor from uh, actually Valparaiso University has developed is a way of finding the right adjunct professor, tracking their progress, seeing how well they relate to the students, how do the students grade them, and are the students actually learning what they're supposed to be in those courses, and keeping that data. Because as you probably have heard, the government is kind of cracking down on a lot of community colleges and, and certainly the for-profit colleges and saying, hey, you're, you're, not, you're turning up people who, who didn't learn anything and can't get jobs. Uh, so this is a way of trying to help on that, on that situation. Uh, I'm on the board of something called Immersed Games, which is, all, is teaching science via gameplay. Uh, it's a startup, so it doesn't have anything out in the market yet. And let's see, what else am I on the board of? I'm so you're, so you're on the board of a number of companies yeah, right now, and five, yeah. a lot of them. And yeah. um, you're also, I'm very fortunate, feel very fortunate to have known you for the past five, six years as a fellow colleague and investor yes. at Also Blue Partners. You're a venture capitalist. How did you get yeah. into VC in the first place? Well, I, I, I see VC as being very similar to what I did at Knowledge Universe, mm -hmm. because there we were hearing presentations from from startups and either investing in them and, and helping them literally from ground zero or we were investing in them after they had had some success in the world. So I had some experience as a VC in those days. I must tell you our approach with uh, Larry and Mike was quite different than the typical VC approach though. I mean as you know the VC approach today here in Silicon Valley is uh, we'll give you some money and then we'll give you some more when you reach this milestone, and then we'll give you some more when you reach this milestone, and then some more when you reach this milestone. Uh, our approach at Knowledge Universe was we don't want our CEOs running around raising money. We want them focused on running the company and building the company. So we would purposefully over-invest in the company. And, uh, and they never, our CEOs never had to worry about raising capital again. We gave them enough to, at the beginning to pretty much build them to being a substantial company. So I, I had to switch roles a little bit with working with Gilman and Stu to get used to uh, the current way of, of thinking. And, and of course, uh, Stuart and Gilman are, are uh, and, and Bill Kroll and Jim Wims and the rest of the crew over at LSEPLOI are absolutely brilliant guys and brilliant at seeing what 
technologies can turn into real businesses, uh, uh, how to evaluate that, and, uh, and they specialize obviously in certain areas. Um, and so I've learned a lot by being, being associated with, with, with them. But I, my role is, it, there is really just as a advisor to Stu and Gilman on the, some, of the, some of the companies. I'm certainly not involved in all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, time for a couple of fun questions. Um, so um, there's a book that you're heavily featured in called Console Wars. I have a couple copies of that, and it's set to be released as a documentary and hopefully also um, a feature film. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about all of that? Like Very strange. <laughs> uh, you know, when the, when the author, Blake Harris, suggested this to me, suggested writing a book on the war between Sega and Nintendo, I remember saying to him, that's very interesting, Blake. There's probably 200 people in the world who care. And he said, no, no, you're wrong. That period of time is very interesting to a large segment of the audience, and retro gaming is kind of back. Uh, and, and, and he turned out to be right. He interviewed over 300 people, interviewed my whole Sega team, and then also the Nintendo team. And, and so when reading the book, I actually learned a lot because I didn't know what the Nintendo guys were, were thinking at the, at the time. I didn't know they had a, they had a a dartboard with my picture on it. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, that's going to so, be in the movie. Yeah, hopefully. I think so. <laughs> and and the documentary has been shot, but Sony has the distribution rights for both the documentary and the feature film. In the feature film, the script is being written, I th supposedly, by Seth Rogen. Well, Seth has been really busy lately, doing so many different movies and commercials and what have you. That he, he's way behind on the script writing. So I had hoped that this was all going to be done by the end of this year and the movie would be produced next year and released toward the end of next year. But clearly it's going to be, again, if it happens, it'll be 2018. Blake tells me that Sony is committed to getting the movie done. So it's, he says it's just a question of time and that Sony wants to use the documentary as part of the marketing for the feature film. So that's what's going on with that. Okay, so I'm going to test you on some current news. Um, so last week, Nintendo announced a new console mobile gaming system hybrid called Nintendo yeah. Switch. Um, how do you think about this concept and feel about that? Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, I've never allowed a Nintendo product in my home, so uh, <laughs> so. so uh, this one interests me though, I must say, I, just the look of it, the idea of having a mobile unit that's also a, a console that hooks to your, to your television. I mean, we did something similar. I shouldn't say we, because I was gone from the company by then, but Sega did something similar with the Dreambox uh, uh, years and years ago. But it, this is very compact and it looks very interesting to me, but it all comes down to how good is the gameplay and how good does it feel when you're playing the game. An awful lot of video game play is, is simply that, is how good does the controllers feel? How good does it look when you're controlling the action on the screen? How instantaneous is it? Uh, how good is the feedback? So I guess I'm going to have to buy the damn thing when it comes nice. out. It'll be the first Nintendo product in my home. My boys have Sony in the home. They have Xbox in the home. We still have, I have probably 850 Genesis games. I have two Genesis systems still hooked up. I have an arcade system hooked up. So I still play games. Um, so what do you think is uh, the next big market trend, the next kind of billion dollar um, opportunity? Well, it obviously has to be Blackstorm. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about Blackstorm since no one actually knows about Blackstorm here? Well, you haven't told them? No, I haven't, so I guess you can give them. No, 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 no. I usually, you could do it much better than I am, but I, I'm very interested in what uh, Ernestine is doing because um, I'm also chairman of Gazillion Games. I, I guess I forgot to mention that. And, uh, and, and, and a couple other things. And a couple other things. Uh, Gazillion, it its claim to fame is it has the Marvel Heroes license for PC and soon other platforms. And uh, it's a heck of a game. It's really a good, it's really a good game. Uh, but they've had some issues in the past that we're trying to correct. I, 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 and I think we're, we've done that now, getting players into the game sooner. If you can't get them in in the first five minutes, you're not going to get them in. Uh, and there were a few other glitches with it, uh, the monetization system, what have you, has been fixed now. So I think it's about to, to take off. But one of the issues in 
doing games is how do you do a game and have it playable on all of the different platforms and how do you have it playable on mobile and how do you have it playable on tablet and how do you have it playable on console or PC or what have you and the answer for quite a while people have said it's going to be HTML5 will allow us to deliver games uh, to all different devices and have them playable and high quality but it hasn't happened. But Ernestine's company has figured out how to do this. So she's figured out the technology for having it as good a game as it is on a console on, a other, uh, on other devices delivered via messenger apps or not messenger apps, me uh, messenger platforms uh, or other ways. So this is solving, a, I think solving a huge problem. So. Mm -hmm. You Kudos described it very you. well, yeah, Did better I? than I can. Did so, I? No, um, <laughs> I'm sure that's not the case. You so, can describe it much better. Um, so we'll open it up um, since we have about 15 minutes left. I um, want to give everyone a chance to answer any questions we haven't covered. Yep. What do you think about VR and its, and its uh, future with gaming? Well, I think that's one of the other things that could be huge. Uh, I love VR. I've been messing around with VR since my Sega days and I uh, actually worked with a guy named Jaron Lanier who's considered the father of, of VR back in the mid-90s. And, and we were going to do a VR helmet with, uh, hooked to a Genesis and the, and the problem was, and we developed some kind of interesting games, the problem, <laughs> the problem was because the technology was not there yet, <clears throat> the frame rate was so slow, it was completely disorienting. And you would have this helmet on and you would either fall over and hit your head or you'd throw up, one of the two. It was, it, you got nauseous playing the games for more than a few minutes. And so we, didn't, we stopped doing it. So I've been waiting for technology to overcome those issues. Uh, I last week went over to Facebook and I know some people over there and I, I, I used their VR for quite a long time and the games that they've developed. And I, and I think it's there. Uh, it's really good. The problem is the price is so high that that's going to keep it from being a mass market uh, product right now, at least the VR side. The AR is here today. I mean, I think the AR is, is really terrific and maybe has a bigger impact than, uh, than the VR. I mean, the, the, Niantic, yeah. the Niantic guys, the, the product they did initially with AR was not Pokemon Go. The first product they did was take your iPhone and look at the Golden Gate Bridge and it would start talking to you and tell you the history of the Golden Gate Bridge and who the architect was and how long it took to build it. Go look at the Lincoln Monument, it would tell you the same kind of thing. So it was an educational product that used AR. Uh, and I think that's still a, a, one of the terrific uses for, for AR. I feel VR is gonna be as, good in or be as good in education too, it's just that it's so expensive right now. So we still have a ways to go, but you know, for those of us who can afford to pay $395 for a headset and $1,000 for a PC, it's a, it's a pretty good experience right now. Uh, you mentioned that you received some pushback at Sega for releasing an educational game uh, rather than producing another Sonic title. And I'm wondering whether kind of as you delve into the education space, uh, you saw similar conflicts between optimizing for building a business and for helping people in building products for that. Well, yes, not so much from the businesses that I was involved in, but uh, honestly, I noticed that entertainment companies in general, when they move into education, have had a really tough time sticking with it and doing it well. And I love Disney, but Disney's a great example of it. I mean, at one point, Disney had uh, quite a bit of educational software. They've kind of let it, kind of let it go. Uh, they have terrific preschools that they've built in China, but it doesn't seem to be a focus of, of, the, of the company. Because again, it's so easy to make more money profits in entertainment than it is in education. Doing it in education is really hard work and you really have to stick, stick with it. Uh, so I, I think I've noticed it more for, for, the, for whether it's Disney or Sony or uh, 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 Saban's company or any of those other entertainment companies, it's very hard for them to stick with uh, education and, and do it well. Um, anyway. So you mentioned the rise of AR and VR. Do you think those are going to be complementary systems to console gaming or they'll eventually replace console gaming? 
Um, I don't think they'll necessarily replace. I just see it as a, as a better uh, or a different experience. I mean, I was playing a, uh, they all, they're doing a lot of shooters, by the way. That seems to be the, the VR thing to do is a shooter. And I was playing one uh, la last week. And boy, it's really, it's really cool. I mean, so I can't imagine going back to a, a regular shooter, I guess, on console. But I think there's many other types of games that I would still play on a, on a console or a PC or an iPad or a phone uh, than, than just VR. I don't think VR will completely replace uh, those types of games. I think it's just another experience, a very good experience. Combining uh, gaming and education for little kids makes sense. Uh, is there a way you can parlay those principles into adult education or professional education, uh, for example, in the medical field? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I really believe that that is the case. Um, I'm, I'm not up to speed on what they're doing in, in medical, but my understanding is that's going to be one of the areas where VR will actually, because it's affordable and things are so expensive in the medical world as it is, that that's where one of the first places that they'll be uh, they'll be using that that technology is in in medicine. Uh, I heard both in nursing and medical schools there now is quite a bit of work being done using VR to to help teach better, if you will, more realistic experiences. Obviously, yeah. Uh, but I'll, in the whole general area of adult education, one of my I still think we can make all curriculum as fun and interesting as a video game. Um, as a CEO of multiple large corporations that were somewhat tangential but really in unique industries, how much do you attribute your success to employing similar strategies, whether it's in marketing or product placement or <coughs> positioning across those industries, or were those really unique to your individual positions? Uh, in, in those industries themselves. Well, I think in the in the toy and video game days, uh, the the similarity was we were dependent on retail. There was no online. There was no Amazon in those days, and so in that sense, the strategies were somewhat similar. Except that what I always did was I my belief in a strategy is if someone else can easily copy what you're doing, you don't have a strategy. So I was always trying to push my folks, my teammates, to be uh, different, you know, to come up with different thoughts. It used to drive them crazy, by the way. I mean, I really drove all the product managers and marketing directors nuts at Mattel and Sega. Uh, they all still liked me, though. It was fun. <laughs> but, uh, but I was always looking for that unusual idea that, uh, that could break through the, uh, the clutter of, of marketing, or for that matter, product development. Uh, so I think that the commonality uh, was retail in those days. The difference in the education world again is trying again to do things differently, to build products that are that are different, to attack the market. Whether it's a school, a lot of the stuff I'm doing, you have to sell to schools, which is really tough. You know, school districts are hard to get through. Uh, the decision making cycle is brutal. You know, we have salespeople at Cambium Learning Group who who they working on a school district, working on a school district, working on a school district, and finally they, ah, I'm never gonna get anywhere, and three years later they get an order. Just appears, you know, but it happens three years after the last time they called on the place. So, yeah. um, so you mentioned a couple times where you've been told, like, such and such product is dead, Barbie's dead, or, or you know, parents are never gonna pay for educational toys or something. I mean, do you have a methodology where you approach these kinds of things to, to suddenly make them grow again? Well, I think I described it, but I, I also, I'm, I'm, a, I'm really a cynic. You know, I, I really don't believe experts. I think most of the Wall Street analysts uh, don't have a clue what they're talking about. Uh, they, just, they just, you know, I just don't believe much of anything they say. So, so that, as a starting point, that's helpful for me in the businesses I've, I've been in where I just assumed they were wrong and assumed that there was a way of, of uh, uh, having those businesses recover and grow again. Certainly that was the case with Barbie, it was the case with Hot Wheels, it was the case with, with Matchbox, it was the case with, with Sega, and not believing the analysts on, on LeapFrog certainly worked for, for the betterment of the, of the company for a long time. And so I guess that being a cynic to start with was very helpful, and then when you, when you 
again, get your people to think differently about how they've been doing the business uh, up through then, that also was, was very helpful to me. Yeah. Um, so you've been in leadership positions in many big companies, and when joining a big company, how did you find it trying to gain the trust of your co-workers, trying to figure out your vision for that company mm. and implementing them in such a short time frame? Yeah. Um, I always really tried hard to be the best teammate that I could when I was a product manager or a marketing director or even a vice president. Before I, be, once you become CEO, you're kind of not a teammate anymore in a way. But anyway, I, I really worked hard at being the best teammate I could. I was always very supportive of uh, the engineers. I prided myself on, my father was a professor of engineering, so I knew how to talk to engineers. So I prided myself on being able to speak technical. Uh, you know, I used to like to, to work on their calculus problems when they're still in school and help them with that. Anyway, I, I, tried, to, I tried to be uh, the best teammate that I could and really supportive. And, and I look for that trait when I'm hiring people. I, I want people who are, who are able to work on teams very, very well. Uh, I used the, the sports analogies a lot, and I, and I think it's, it's, it's valid. If, if, the, you know, it, if you're not a, a team player in big companies, it's really hard for you to, to advance very far. I mean, as a startup, I guess you can be that independent, brilliant genius who, who everybody else has to, has to listen to. But if, but if you want to get along a in a big company and build, help build a big company and get to a position where you can actually uh, uh, benefit uh, and, and have some unique ideas yourself, I think you have to start by being a great teammate. Um, so to, in today's like, <coughs> digital age, you increasingly see like, three or four year olds playing uh, more on like, the iPhones and the iPads. What do you think the implications are for like, <coughs> Mm. Well, you know, you have to have both, obviously. I mean, I think the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics just issued their new guidelines for young children and screen-based uh, entertainment. And uh, they said to limit, for two years old and under, I may get this wrong, but I think for two years old and under, they said limit it to one hour uh, a day of screen time. And then from two to four, I think it's like two hours a day, and then four and up, it's a little bit more than that. So, uh, and I think that's probably c correct. I mean, you don't want little kids spending all their time on a, on a screen. You want them out playing. You want them to touch physical objects and be playing with physical. I mean, I think the best educational toy I ever invented is Lego. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's really a terrific product, and that's why it's so successful and so large. So I am really interested in the EdTech space and all. Thank you for talking about all this stuff today. Um, one of the things I have been thinking about is education on the teacher-based side, which you're hinting at with some of your companies or talking about whether that be educating workforce people or actually educating the teachers themselves in the education system. And one of the toughest things that you also touched on is figuring out how to, I guess, get revenue in a model where teachers aren't the ones necessarily making the decisions for that, the administrators, the school are. So I guess, how do you balance those two sort of competing things? What would be best for the teachers, best for the students, or best for the administrators given their resource constraints? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've seen so, so often, um, and I, I think we might be getting to this, a, somebody makes a decision to buy a new education technology product and put it in a school. And then it never gets used. The teacher never, never uses it. It sits in a, in a closet somewhere or it's never used properly or what have you. And, and that's, a, that's a real issue. Um, so the way I've tried to, the companies that I'm advising on this anyways, is you got to get the teacher part of it right first. I mean, the teacher really has to fall in love with whatever this new technology is. And a good example of that is, is learning A to Z. So learning A to Z, here's their model. Uh, there's a whole bunch of folks, uh, educators, run by a professor out of University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. 
and uh, a guy named Bob Hall, terrific individual. And what he does is he has his group turn out a book online every week that's on a topic that's topical. So right now, it would, of course, be about the election. God knows how you would do a book to preschoolers on what's going on today. But anyway, he, he, will, he turns out uh, from kindergarten through sixth grade, three levels of reading for kindergarten, three levels of reading for first grade, second grade, on, on a topic that's timely. And of course, the teachers like that because they know that the kids are going to be interested in this. They're hearing, what's, they're hearing their parents talk about it. And so it has the correct vocabulary for each of those different, for leveled reading, essentially. <coughs> and he turns them out online, and the teachers absolutely love it. <coughs> Most of them use it on, online, but an awful lot of them still print each book out. <laughs> so they print 25 books out and give them to the kids in the classroom. But at least they're using you know, the materials that are going to help kids uh, uh, improve their, their reading skills by just reading more and more and more. But anyway, that's, so that's one, I think you, you have to start with the teacher. You've got to get it right with the teacher. And, and so much of this stuff has been too complicated for the teachers to really use in the classroom. Instead of saving them time, it cost them time. And that was a, that's a, been a real issue in the, <clears throat> anyway. Um, so final question, can you provide any final words of advice um, for us here today? Well, I, I already heard that my favorite advice somebody already offered. So, uh, I mean, I, I've been really, really lucky, I think, aside from always having great teams around me, I've been really lucky that I loved what I was doing. You know, I've loved what I was working on. And uh, <clears throat> I'm still very passionate about education. I still am, I'm still trying to figure out how we can personalize curriculum for each student so that it really gets into what that student's uh, interests are. So if a kid is interested in automobiles but he's terrible in math, let's deliver math curriculum to him in an automobile paradigm. Um, and so I'm, I'm still passionate about a lot of things that I want to keep working on and I think that's obviously the advice I would give anybody is, uh, is f have a job that you really Find a passion and then find a job within that passion. It may not be exactly the right, the right, the right job at the time, but at least you'll be doing something that you that you're, have an interest in, that you're really interested in, and, that, and then just develop that further. Become an expert in that particular area. Um, one of the things that I, I always did was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a walking toy encyclopedia. I mean, I really learned the toy industry. <laughs> And I learned the video game industry. And, and, uh, and I think that really helps too, is that you become an expert within that field in that, in that particular company. So that, that's certainly advice I, I, I would give, and I know others have, have given you that. And then the one other I talked about already is both, both have a great team around you, but be the best teammate that you can possibly be. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Thank you again, Tom. Yeah.